Well, welcome to Voices of Courage. I'm your host, Ken D. Foster. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the health challenges that are facing our youth and facing those that have been exposed to some of the uh, bacteria, the viruses, the uh, misinformation, the mental challenges that are out there. We're going to be discussing taking a deep dive into anorexia today. Uh, it's not a subject that uh, I usually have on my show. We don't talk about this, but uh, you, as you will find out, uh, you know, you probably know somebody that's anorexic or know somebody that knows somebody because this is a, a, a uh, I would say, almost an epidemic in our country today. So I think it's an important show. I hope you'll listen to it. I have a very special guest on the show today that's going to help you to maybe even break through your own mental barriers around this so that we can have a more healthful, uh, vital, and uh, joyful uh, society. That's that's my my goal for this show. So I hope you'll pay uh, close attention to it. And I'm gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with my guest. If you or someone you love has developed Parkinson's disease after being exposed to Gramoxone or any herbicide containing the deadly chemical Paraquat, you may be entitled to financial compensation. If you developed Parkinson's and worked or lived on a farm that used Paraquat herbicide treatments with Gramoxone, Firestorm, or any listed brand, call now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. There are time deadlines, so don't delay. If you don't win, you pay nothing. 800-771-3380. Well, welcome back to the show. This is Ken D. Foster, and today I'm very blessed to have Dr. Greenblatt on the show today. Dr. Greenblatt has uh, lectured internationally on science, uh, scientific evidence for nutritional interventions in psychiatry and mental illness. He is the author of seven books, including Answers to Anorexia, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, James uh, Greenblatt is an MD. He's a psychiatrist. He's treated patients since 1988. He's got the experience, knowledge, and wisdom to really make a dent, I believe, in this uh, disease of anorexia. And you got the new book out there, Dr. Greenblatt. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, can hear you. we can hear you great now. Okay. Not sure what okay. that technical issue was, but you know, those things happen when we're uh, in this uh, kind of new uh, new society where everything's online and technical. So um, let's, uh, I was just talking to the audience about your, your background and your experience. How did you get involved in the anorexia uh, epidemic uh, that's been going on? And, and let, tell us a little bit about your experience about that. Sure. I've been practicing uh, child psychiatry for um, over 30 years. And for the past 23 years, almost exclusively uh, focused on eating disorders, uh, not by choice, just um, was directing a hospital that had a small unit. And, and over these years, uh, we've just seen an explosion in, uh, in rates and incidents. Um, and certainly since the pandemic, uh, rates have really just skyrocketed. And it's not just in the United States, it's, it's really globally across, um, across the globe. And uh, these kids are getting sicker. And what most people don't understand is that these disorders that we're calling anorexia nervosa is a life-threatening illness. These kids are dying. Well, is this a uh, is this a physical uh, illness? Is this a mental illness? What's the cause of this? What's causing the anorexia? Well, it's all the above, and um, recent research has at least established the genetic uh, genetic correlation, which has enabled uh, clinicians to understand that it is a biologically based illness. 
It's not going on a diet. It's not trying to lose weight. There is a, a genetic vulnerability in some individuals. And when they do start losing weight, uh, something triggers in the brain to have a disorder that we call anorexia nervosa. So it's brain-based. It has to do with neurochemistry, metabolism. And that's why psychotherapy is, is just not sufficient to treat this life-threatening illness. Uh, I, I really, I'm really glad you said that. I, I you know, I, I've had a lot of uh, doctors on the show and uh, neuroscientists, um, you know, they talk about epigenetics where they can turn on and off genes, uh, but they were talking about whatever those genes are, they're turned, you know, on or off. And this is causing this, uh, this, uh, this disease. Um, what's the treatment for this? Well, you know, our current model, which we've been using for 30 years is just, um, uh, you know, encourage weight gain to bring in someone into the hospital using an NG tube any way we can. Someone gains weight, but there's no concept of treating the underlying illness. So they leave and the relapse rates are very high and there's no current FDA approved medication for this disorder. So the treatment approach is pretty random and uh, I think really deficient. And, and my work is trying to establish a, a missing link, which I believe is chronic nutritional deficiencies. It, it makes a lot of sense. It makes uh, sense that we would have to treat it a different way. I mean, the old story is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not real familiar with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rates of curing anorexia. Um, in the in the old paradigm, what percentage of people would actually be cured of this? Or is this just a lifelong illness that someone has to deal with? No, uh, people get better. You know, there's a, a third that get better, a third that stay chronically ill. Um, the other kind of frightening statistic is anorexia nervosa has the highest risk of mortality of any psychiatric illness and the highest risk of suicide, which is certainly uh, part of the current conversation around the mental health crisis in our country. Wow. Okay, well, listen, I'm gonna take a quick break. When we get back, I'd like to take a dive into your new book and uh, find out a little bit about why you wrote it and what can our audience benefit by reading this book. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Here's an important message from the Diabetes Solution Center. Diabetics understand all too well the pain of pricking your fingers. But now, by wearing a small remote device called a Continuous Glucose Monitor, or CGM, you can immediately reduce your pain. It's easy to use and helps you make more accurate diabetes treatment decisions. If you are testing your blood sugar four or more times daily, injecting insulin three or more times daily, or using an insulin pump, call the Diabetes Solution Center right now Well, welcome back, everybody. This is Kendi Foster, and we're talking to Dr. Greenblatt. Dr. Greenblatt is an MD. He has lectured internationally on scientific evidence for nutritional interventions in psychiatry and mental illness. Specifically, we're talking about anorexia nervosa today, and he has a new book out uh, that we're going to be talking about here in just a second. Um, actually, we're going to do it right now. So, Dr. Um, what inspired the new book? You've been writing for a long time. You've got many books out in the world. Answers to Anorexia. What inspired this? Well, this is an updated edition of a work that I did over 10 years ago, which basically tried to shake the eating disorder community a bit and ask them to see what's in front of them. These patients are uh, emaciated and malnourished and nobody was treating the malnutrition. So I talked about nutritional deficiencies, vitamin B12, vitamin B, looking at the gut, understanding the role of a nutrition and brain function. Mm. And over the past 10 years, there's been hundreds of articles supporting this thesis. And I just felt it was important to update the references and try again to get the eating sort of community. And the book was written for parents to understand that chronic malnutrition affects the brain and makes this disorder harder to treat. 
Well, what is the uh, nutritional deficiency syndrome? What is that that uh, goes along with anorexia? Well, again, it's common sense, but really ignored in our medical community. Some of these kids are avoiding, um, you know, large uh, nutrient class of food, like all fat, and, and fat's essential for brain function. Um, many are shifting to a vegan vegetarian diet. And in adolescence, we have good research that that's a kind of a recipe for disaster for someone who's genetically vulnerable because there's not adequate zinc and B12 in a vegetarian diet for kids that are trying to get through puberty. So it's a combination, I call it the perfect storm of this genetically vulnerable kid trying to get through puberty, restrictive eating, sets up this nutritional deficiency syndrome that just keeps someone in this cycle of uh, disordered eating. Hmm. You know, in your book, you talk about you are what you don't eat. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about that. What what am I that I don't eat? <laughs> what is that? Well, you know, there might be a lot of vegan vegetarians that are going to get upset, but let's say you're not eating animal products. Uh, zinc requirements increase during puberty to help you get through puberty. So for those uh, vegans, um, what they're not getting is adequate zinc. And we know zinc deficiency uh, contributes to the symptoms of anorexia. And there's also research, ignored, but uh, there, that shows zinc as a nutritional supplement can help some individuals with anorexia nervosa. Okay. And, you know, also in your book, you talk about that antidepressants don't necessarily work for anorexics. Is that is that correct? Yeah, the research has repeatedly demonstrated that there's no medication currently approved for anorexia nervosa. And there's research in my clinical experience with thousands of patients that oftentimes the antidepressants, uh, one, they don't help, but they also can get in the way of recovery. So we have no medications to provide patients and families for kids with anorexia nervosa. Hmm. Do you think uh, anorexia nervosa can be cured just by food? I mean, is this, is this a diet? seems like it's a diet thing. If we're eating the proper foods, can it actually be healed? Uh, well, absolutely. But it's um, what happens when someone develops this illness is their brain and their thought process change and they believe uh, that they are overweight when they're underweight. So these distorted perceptions, it's not necessarily easy. And, and that's kind of been the uh, issue is both parents and providers will just say, well, eat. And it's not that simple because uh, they are overwhelmed with uh, emotional fear and turmoil, thinking of eating and gaining weight. So as a psychiatrist, um, when somebody comes into the office uh, with this disease, and um, what, what's like the first thing that you're going to be talking about with them? Is it, is it the, the emotional aspect, the mental, emotional, you know, the physical? Is it, is it, it seems like it's all combined. Maybe there's even a spiritual component to this, but it seems like there's a lot going on here. Yeah. I mean, the first message has to be your child has a, a serious medical illness. We need to understand it as we would any other serious illness like cancer, which means uh, we need to get them treatment, whether whatever that entails. And that, as you described, is both psychological, biological, and even spiritual, because it is really important that the illness doesn't take meaning in their life. So stressing the importance of the illness. And then, you know, for younger kids, we have a family-based treatment programs that do work, but it's families really taking control of eating. And then the medical approach has to be considered. So the, the message, the first nine messages out of 10 is we need to take this illness seriously. It's not about losing weight not about losing weight. And I think you touched on a subject that I think is interesting. Some people identify themselves with their disease. They put meaning to the disease. If that's happening for somebody, how, how do you break that? It takes time. They get entrenched in, in the, the power and the control and all the dynamics around kind of weight loss. And that is where therapy and oftentimes uh, residential uh, treatment can support a, a, a adolescent and a family to help 
uh, develop you know uh, other parts of their life that do have meaning and can help them lift out of this. And you know what's uh, what comes to my mind is um, you know I know this is a complicated. It seems like a complicated illness. And are there um, are there other illnesses or diseases that are associated with anorexia nirvana? Uh, sorry, anorexia. And, it, you know, if so, what are those, you know, that are predominantly, if you have anorexia, you also have this. Yeah, uh, rarely would we be seeing a child or adolescent with just anorexia nervosa. Oftentimes, anxiety is a significant component, sometimes a form of obsessive compulsive disorder. A depression is common. It's not uncommon. Some of these kids have um, infections and other medical problems. So it just sets the course of a whole range of psychological and medical complications, if not aggressively treated early. You know, do, uh, uh, do you run across um, uh, patients that are self-medicating uh, with this disease? And if so, what, what are they, you know, what is that that they are self-medicating? And maybe we're self-medicating with different types of foods or even drugs or alcohol or something like that to overcome this these feelings of inadequacy or anxiety or what whatever they're going through. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, as this disorder kind of seeps into uh, an individual, they are kind of uh, paralyzed with a, a chronic um, uh, fear, a pathological fear. So they're anxious all the time. So the self-medicating is trying to get rid of that anxiety because they can't get these thoughts about their head, about their weight out of their head. So exercise is the most common. These are the people you see in the gym for hours, maybe walking the streets in the cold or two in the morning. So compulsive exercising, also uh, purging, uh, you know, vomiting uh, releases some anxiety and also drugs and alcohol. Alcohol being very common can relieve some of this anxiety. And, and then restrictive eating relieves the anxiety. So our patients with anorexia nervosa, they're not, not eating to make their parents angry. They're not eating because their brain just doesn't uh, tolerate the food and the anxiety associated with the food. So their lives are set up to relieve that anxiety. Wow. All right. Listen, I got to take a quick break. When we come back. I'd like to take a little deeper dive into why this is uh, uh, increase. The numbers are so increasing across the nation and across the world. So we'll take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, let's discuss that. Ah, oh, welcome back, everybody. This is Kendi Foster. I'm the host of the Voice of the Courage Show, and uh, we have Dr. Greenblatt with us today. We're discussing. His latest book, yeah, which is called Answers to Anorexia, it's on the screen right now. And before I get into that question, I want to ask you, uh, doctor, uh, where can people get the book? I know I can get it on Amazon. Uh, is there any other websites or bookstores that you want to recommend uh, that they can pick up the book? Uh, sure. Uh, the web, my, our website is uh, jamesgreenblattmd.com. So just my name, dot com. Okay. So let, let me, uh, you went on that. That was a little quick. I have a listening audience too. So uh, it's uh, James, J-A-M-E-S, uh, Greenblatt, Greenblatt, G-R-E-E-N-B-L-A-T-T.com. So for my listening audience, I hope you'll uh, you'll check it out. All right. You know, it, it. we touched on it earlier in the show about how this is really starting to be, a, uh, the numbers are growing, right? And there's probably a lot of factors in that. What do you think the number one factor of why these numbers are growing with the anorexia nervosa right now? Well, I think there are, there are a number of factors. Um, the rates were increasing before the pandemic, but the pandemic really kind of um, you know skyrocketed these rates. These kids were home, um, on social media, visually comparing themselves. Uh, lots of uh, social media sites, and this came out in the Facebook trials, you know, kind of uh, engaging uh, women looking at weight loss and dieting. So the social media piece certainly um, contributed with the social isolation 
as well as, you know, my theory is um, this very um, seductive increase in a vegan diet in these young adolescents where they're not getting adequate nutrients. I wonder, you know, I, I don't know if there's any research on this. I wonder if the vaccinations themselves have had any impact on um, on this uh, increase. Have you touched on that at all, or do you know anything about that? Yeah, there hasn't been any research looking at the uh, either the vaccines or the infection uh, contributing to the increased rates because they were already kind of increasing pretty dramatically. But one of the the newer things we talk about in the book that's not addressed enough is there are infections from Lyme disease to other, even strep infection that has contributed to this growth of uh, anorexia nervosa. Wow, okay. Wow, a lot going on with this thing. All right, so, um, uh, you know, so how can uh, families, uh, let's, let's talk about the family. Let's talk about the early signs of this. And what should a family look for? Sure. I mean, the, the concern if someone loses weight in our culture, everyone is saying, great job, you look good, particularly if, um, you know, they've been told by the pediatrician or someone else to lose weight. So initially, some of the symptoms are ignored, but then as a child might be missing meals, wearing baggy pants, um, going to the bathroom after meals, um, not eating fat, not eating meat, I mean, all these are kind of red flags to at least talk about diet, health, and body image with your children. Again, this illness is treatable if we can address it early. That's good. Okay. Um, we talked earlier about conventional treatment isn't necessarily the way to go. Do you give, in the book, do you give some uh, 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 ways to uh, treat this that maybe aren't in the public? Sure. And, and I mean, to apply conventional treatment is not the way to go. My career has been in conventional eating disorder treatment. What I'm looking for asking uh, everyone is to kind of augment our conventional treatment model with a better understanding of malnutrition and nutritional support. So conventional treatment will involve residential care, uh, group therapy, individual therapy, medications to decrease the anxiety, nutritional support, but that is not sufficient to always prevent these kids from just relapsing. And the underlying nutritional deficiencies aren't usually addressed in our conventional model. Yeah. You know, if you had, uh, you know, if you're, you're speaking at, uh, you know, a convention of psychiatrists, what, what would you tell them about this that maybe they need to start doing in a, in a different direction? What's a new story that we can be telling around this disease to really help uh, increase our cure rates? I think the new story is understanding uh, micronutrients and brain function, particularly mm -hmm. zinc uh, and magnesium, and also understand macronutrients like essential fatty acids. I mean, we've all been hearing about fish, right? It's good for you. Um, and some of these kids have been avoiding fat for one, 10, 15 years. 60% of the brain is fat. And, uh, you know, fat deficiency uh, creates a number of the symptoms uh, these young kids are struggling with. Well, that's interesting. So, you know, we talked about maybe a vegan diet wouldn't be the ideal diet for these children. Um, what about a keto diet, uh, you know, where they're increasing their fats and uh, proteins um, in, uh, in cutting out the, uh, you know, the sugars and that type of thing? Well, fascinating question. Uh, there's, um, you know, a study going on on anorexia and keto, but it's not something that I would recommend. For binge eating disorder and other eating disorders, ketogenic diets have seen tremendous benefit. But for anorexia nervosa, where they are malnourished, underweight, a ketogenic diet can be dangerous. So that is something I would not uh, attempt without uh, very careful medical supervision. Okay, good. And uh, just a uh, uh, step back a second. You talked about micronutrients in, in zinc and uh, um, another one, I, I, I don't remember, but let's just go with the zinc. What is it that seems to be in the micronutrients in zinc that seems to be effective in treating this disease? 
Sure. Again, zinc is mostly bioavailable in animal products. And during puberty, there's a higher need for zinc, just like in pregnancy. So again, that perfect storm. And, and what we know is zinc is a micronutrient. It has to do with a brain function, how we make serotonin in the brain. And it also has to do with digestion. So all of our digestive enzymes are zinc dependent. So, so many of these kids with eating disorders, they, they get bloated, they get stomach aches. So eating is just not tolerable. And so by addressing the zinc deficiency and supporting their digestion, they're just gonna be better able to participate in therapy. That's great. That's awesome. Okay, well, listen, I, uh, I have one, uh, one or two more questions for you here. <laughs> um, you know, you got the microphone to the world right now, right? We're in 185 countries, doctor. And um, I'm wondering, what is your message to the world right now around this disease? What, what, what would you say, you know, you've got, you've, got a big, you've got a big audience here. What do you want to tell them? Uh, and, you know, as I've said a, a couple times that eating disorders are increasing and we're all aware of it. And not only are the rates increasing, but the age of onset is decreasing. We're seeing eight to 10 year olds who are refusing to eat. And the message is aggressively treat this illness early because these young adolescents can be treated. And then the message um, embedded in everything I do is really try to appreciate the concept of malnutrition because the brain utilizes 25% of our energy, our metabolic energy. So all the nutrients, the vitamin and minerals has to be utilized by the brain first. And supplementing with nutri nutritional therapy can uh, support recovery and prevent relapse. I love it. Dr. Greenblatt, thank you so much for being on the show. The book is The Answers to Anorexia. I hope that you will consider picking that book up, especially if you have any kind of anorexia uh, nervosa going on in your family or any signs of that. I think this book will help you. So I hope you'll check it out. Doctor, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you. Appreciate you being here and taking your time today. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate the opportunity. And for all of you that are listening to our show, uh, this is an important subject. And I hope uh, if this has touched your heart or you know somebody that's suffering from this, I hope you will pass this show on to them. You can <clears throat> tell Alexa Cortana or Siri to just play Voices of Courage podcast. It'll come right up for you. And what else? You can go to our website, go to voiceofcourage.us or go to any of our Facebook pages or YouTube. You can download it. You can pass it on. You can subscribe to our channel. All righty. I think that's it for me. So until um, next time, continue to see the unseeable, know the unknowable, and do the impossible. Mm -hmm.